No event could have filled me with greater anxieties than that of which the notification was transmitted by your order. On the one hand, I was summoned by my country, whose voice I can never hear but with veneration and love. On the other hand, the magnitude and difficulty of the trust to which the voice of my country called me could not but overwhelm with despondence one who ought to be peculiarly conscious of his own deficiencies. George Washington, First Inaugural Address, April 30th, 1789. He was 57 when he became the nation's first president, chosen by all 69 members of the Electoral College and to this day the only person unanimously elected to office. George Washington was one of the most famous men in the world by that time. His years as a Virginia statesman, as commander-in-chief of the Revolutionary Forces, and as president of the Constitutional Convention had secured him the kind of reputation few questioned. He was a towering figure physically as well, nearly six foot three and about 200 pounds, with a bony muscular frame and size 13 boots. He had auburn hair, blue-gray eyes, and false teeth, which contrary to conventional wisdom, weren't made of wood. Some sets were carved out of hippopotamus tusks and others crafted from the teeth of cows. None of them fit him very well, and it's likely he was often in pain as a result. He was an Episcopalian and a Freemason who dressed stylishly, loved to dance, and enjoyed spending evenings reading aloud to his wife. His favorite spot on earth was Mount Vernon, an inherited family estate located just south of what is now Washington, D.C. His greatest wish, he wrote, was to live and die there. When he was 26, he married Martha Dandridge Custis, reputedly the wealthiest widow in Virginia, who added 17,000 acres of land to Washington's 5,000 and 300 slaves to his 49. She was also a mother of two, and Washington became a devoted stepfather to young Jackie and Patsy. The Washingtons never had children of their own. He served from 1789 to 1797. John Adams was his vice president, Thomas Jefferson his secretary of state. He considered himself a political centrist, and it was to his chagrin that his administration coincided with the emergence of the nation's first two political parties, the Democratic Republicans under Jefferson and the Federalist under Alexander Hamilton. Refusing a third term, Washington retired to Mount Vernon in March of 1797. Once again, friends and associates called him general, a designation he preferred to president. After riding across his estate on horseback one snowy December afternoon, he developed a sore throat, which was later complicated by difficulty breathing. Three doctors attended him, bleeding him four times, a conventional treatment of the day. But his condition worsened, and he died shortly after 10 p.m. on December 14, 1799. He was 67. <laughs> 